Okay, and I believe we're live. Hey, Mike, how are you doing, man? Good, what's up? Oh, audio level is a little too high. Let me quickly fix that. I'm sorry. Oh, now I can see you perfectly fine. Hello, I everyone. For, I hope it's loud enough for Brazil to hear. <laughs> hello, Brazil. We have to start the show with always saying hello to Brazil. So if any Brazilians are here, hello. Do it live. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth episode of what's now uh, has become the best, hands down, the best brass podcast in the whole entire world called Dude Live. My name is Algirdas Matonis, a.k.a. Matonis. This is my co-host, Mr. Michael Ding Dingfelder. And today we're going to be answering some of your <laughs> some of your questions from emails, Facebook and even Instagram this time. I actually prepared the Instagram questions. So you are trying. You are trying way too hard right now. Like <laughs> settle, settle down. <laughs> I just feel like uh, I'm over energized. They had a little bit too much coffee. So, um, but um, yeah, how are you doing, man? I haven't seen you for a whole week. I haven't stepped out of the house for a while. I don't even know what the weather is out. Every day is exactly the same. <laughs> Every day, it's exactly the same. Just fact, how you like it. <laughs> it. It's been really cold here, so we haven't even had a, really that much time to, to get out and, 
you know, take the dog for a walk and, and stuff like that. So, okay. Uh, for, for, uh, for people who are watching this online, can somebody give me a fun thumbs up if the audio levels are fine? Uh, and also, uh, please do us a favor and give this video a like, share, subscribe, whether you're watching this live or not. And if you have any questions, please leave them in a the chat box. Uh, this time I'm tracking both Facebook and uh, YouTube, so we'll make sure to answer as many as possible. Ideally, put a question mark at the end of your question. That'll, be, uh, that'll make, make my life a little easier in terms of finding uh finding all the questions through the chat but today we're going to be uh, answering a bunch of questions from emails and etc which i already mentioned so um before we go to emails anything else worth mentioning anything uh, <laughs> anything else you'd like to share also by the way the drink of today back to grapefruit flavor hey the best the best <laughs> I got I got a uh, slightly sick off. Oh, I'm getting some thumbs up. Okay, so we're good to go. <coughs> they're not thumbs upping your uh, your drink choice. They're, they're thumbs upping the sound is good. No, I think it's uh it's the drink. I'm pretty sure it's it's the drink. Actually, uh, I I actually uh, recorded. Um, Drew uh, made me arrangement for a whole suite. Uh, for yeah, uh, I, was, I was watching a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's a really really good arrangement and. Um, uh, I was recording with Brian the tuba parts, and I noticed the same grapefruit flavor seltzer water box there. So I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but it wasn't him. It was uh, somebody. Some are you this. gonna get? Uh, are you gonna get six players, six different players together, and do a recording of that? Or are you just gonna no? Do uh, 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 Brian's doing two tuba parts. I'm doing four euphonium parts, and uh, yeah, yeah. So it's gonna be. It's gonna be uh, just. Um, it's gonna be uh, me and Brian, but uh, it's gonna can be tough. Can we ever play it once? Like, I, I would actually like to play that. Can we can we scrounge together six players and play it at some point? We can do it now, but if uh, I think you're still grounded, so if you want, if you want, I can get you to record some of that. We no, can... no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying in like the future or something like that. That would be fun. No, just to get not even do a recording and like one person do each sort of thing and then you you put it together, but just get. Play through. Whatever we can get the six people together and and give it a whirl, that would yeah, be yeah. fun. I I wanna I wanna I want Drew to ideally uh, later on make a, an arrangement for uh, trumpet, uh, uh, trombone, or French horn and two euphoniums and two tubas. That would be pretty cool. Did, did it have all four movements? Or? Yes, yes, okay. all of it. Yeah, so I I didn't well I I knew it was quite long because normally the the videos I put on Mondays are around five minutes. That's yeah. why what's why this is gonna be like around fifteen minutes. So I've been uh, struggling getting everything edited and recording this week. So I'm a little on edge, <laughs> but I'm gonna get it done by Monday. And no matter what, if if I need to if I need to stay overnight for next two nights, I'm, I'm gonna get that done because, um, yeah, I committed. Anyway, that being said, um, let's go to some of the questions uh, that I received from my friends uh, that sent me emails so that prefer to get in touch with us through emails. Okay, Nathan is asking, do you have any advice on learning euphonium fingerings and getting them muscle and getting muscle muscle memory? Since I was considering learning euphonium, but I'm currently playing trombone in my high school wind ensemble. Uh, any advice with that? I'll let you start off. On this okay, one. So you want some, man, with with muscle memory, I mean, the, the whole thing with muscle memory is just many repetitions of of certain types of things. I mean, scales are always scales are always great to do to to do things like that. Um, you know, it, it maybe even just uh, sort of doing scales with just uh, five scale degrees. You know, the the root to the fifth. Of, of the scale and, and going through things like that, upward and downward patterns, forwards and backwards patterns. Uh, just getting muscle memory for things is is mainly just repetitions. Also, I'm, I'm hearing from a chat that your voice is a little sharp. I was told to pull tuning valve out. Your voice or my no, voice? No, your voice. Oh, so well. just... Uh, it's, it's frozen. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> greased the, uh, the, the vocal cords and... Uh, it's fine. In a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back to normal. Just just lip it down for for <laughs> this live stream. Yeah, <Okay>. but 
<laughs> that's better. You see, that's better. <laughs> that being said, um, yeah, it's it's all about repetition. It's one of the uh, here's the deal with uh, other instruments that use uh, fingers and keys, uh, like piano, for example. That becomes the biggest issue because there are so many different combinations. A wide uh, keyboard, and uh, you're using all the fingers instead of three. And with uh, we we have a very limited amount of combinations on our on our fingering. So that is almost pretty much the only mechanical area that we can practice so that's that's the only the only thing because uh, the uh, the breathing and 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 posture and ambush is such a physical thing that it's not like the more you practice the better you get we only have this one tiny area which is fingers and just very limited combinations reps 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 no b no no other answer and I, I don't think there's any any other good uh, I, I, I can say one more thing with uh, whenever you're finished with your thought about that too. Uh, but yeah, yeah. sure, sure, yeah. absolutely. And uh, uh, but uh, this is what I'm saying. This is fingers. Fingers is probably uh, the easiest part on a brass instrument you can have. Because uh, all the all the physical variables they're not as straightforward and simple to figure out. Because uh, it varies from person to person, it's very hard t to explain how proper breathing should feel and uh, what you should be doing. Just because it's hard to visually show it. When you see a pianist playing with like a, a completely flat fingers, you can tell that hey, you need to round your fingers a little bit, uh, keep them looser. The same thing with our fingers. It's it's one of a few mechanical areas. Just put put a decent amount of repetition, and and there's really no good solution. Just make sure you practice exercises that contain all the uh, finger transitions, all the combination transitions, and all the possible finger combinations. So, for example, chromatic scales, one of my favorite chromatic scales, especially in low register. If you play a uh, euphonium with four valves, practice everything uh, in the low register using uh, four valve combinations and uh, go to back to regular uh, trumpet uh, like combinations. So, uh, that would be that would be the best way uh, to to get your fingers going on. Uh, you wanted to add something? Yeah, sure. If this person really wants to reinforce that muscle memories of, of valve combinations and things like that, um, I've done in the past too, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, a couple of times here together about practicing in a, in a smart way, in a logical way. Uh, with things with fingers too, a lot of times I won't even practice on the horn. I will just sit, like, say if I'm doing something else where it doesn't need my full attention, you know, I'll sit down and I'll go through chromatic patterns or I'll go through scales with my fingers, just working on them specifically. There's only so much practicing that you can do with the horn to your face yeah. that if you can take your horn away and focus on some other things and not bust your chop, that's a perfect thing with, with working on, with working on your fingers. I'm not saying that to do that alone and only, but spend a decent amount of time just moving the fingers where they need to be through scale patterns and chromatic scales and such, and then spend a little bit of time with, with the horn. But doing just the fingers is, is, is a great thing. Yeah, and, and keep it simple. Again, in my opinion, uh, uh, that's that's the, the easiest part of playing a brass instrument is getting good fingers because it's the only mechanical mechanical um, area. One of my best friends um, uh, from when I uh, when I was still living in the UK uh, was an American uh, uh, guy. He was also a euphonium player, uh, Sean, and he was a fantastic uh, euphonium player. But he switched to playing a drum kit, and he's like a fantastic drum kit player. He does the recordings for all those tr all those tracks, uh, all my original works. So, and uh, one time I was speaking with him, and he said, "Dude." You know what? Learning how to get really good at drum kit is just so much easier than <laughs> than uh, than playing euphonium. I can sit by TV, watch Family Guy or whatever, and just uh, practice on a pad and and get better. It, you you can never get better, you know, at tone or range by watching Family Guy or being distracted. It's all about laser focus, and it has very limited uh, amount of time that you can practice. So again, fingers one of a few areas you can really. Uh, milk out whatever you can just just practice with an instrument no instrument uh do the the exercise i showed in uh, one of my finger uh, videos where you can do the separation finger separation exercise all that kind of stuff so i've, I've done some videos check them out as well but uh, hopefully that answers the question okay finn is asking us let me put a timestamp for that 
Uh, hey, I was uh, wondering if you had any suggestions on how to get um, better tone uh, in the range between the B flat fourth line above the staff and B flat above that bass clef. I recently received high school and ensemble audition materials. I need to improve my tone in that register. I'm currently in my last year of middle school and really want uh, to make it into high school wind ensemble. Uh, if I do make it, I would never have to be in the concert band since I've skipped beginning band and middle school concert band. That's can a lot you, of concert can you, band. Can you, say the, can you say the heart of that question one more time? Okay, was so it's act? it's asking it's asking uh, a very specific. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Say it one more time so I can think of something. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how to get better tone in range between the B flat four lines above the staff. So basically above the staff in the B flat uh, and the B flat above that in the bass clef. So an octave above a staff. We're talking about our, our middle B uh, to high B. So they're not talking about the, they're talking about the highest B flat down to the one that's right above the, the right above I would the assume stem. unless, unless we're talking about the super, super, I mean, super, oh, okay. <laughs> that okay. would not make many, much sense at all. So, uh, so that, that would be an answer. That's a very specific question. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'll start off on this one. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> like, um. I don't like uh, I I get uh, I get the question and I understand where the problem is but I, just the way the question is framed tells me that there's a just a, a little bit of a problem in terms of the approach you it's not it's not the range you you cannot get in a good at specific range it's it's a gradual thing it's whether you learn how to get better at range or, or you learn how to control the pitch through air movement, strengthening your amateur and all this stuff. It's not like you're going to practice specific to be specifically good at that range while skipping that, that in between. So uh, just uh, and the other thing too, is it, a, is it a thing about struggling to get that or the tone quality of, of, of up there? Uh, because there's so many different things that could go wrong to cause the tone quality to be affected, especially in the upper register, closing yeah. off of, yeah. of certain things. Yeah, yeah. The pin we talk about uh, quite a bit. This is another one of those questions where it's 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 tough to answer without more information. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, look, this is this is how I normally approach it. First of all, go to youtubecom matonis check all the high range videos i've i've done many many high register videos digging into the details of every single aspect here's video there's a couple of areas uh, when it comes to high register that you want to pay attention it's always when you when you play higher your lips vibrate faster in order for your lips to vibrate faster you need to move faster air when you move faster air and your lips vibrate faster there's more resistance and more pressure and more tension on your lips so you want to make sure that the gap uh, between your lips or in other words aperture does not close in order to sustain flat embouchure and vibrating lips while maintaining the gap you'll need some sort of a musculature strength decent amount so that's something you develop over time so uh, it, it gets gradually better just like any strength building exercise whether it's uh, music related or not once you have sufficient enough uh, musculature to sustain flat embouchure while maintaining that uh, uh, open aperture you want to make sure that you always have enough air so always breathing and you want to make sure that you learn how to control the pitch through tongue movement not adjusting the tension too much you only need enough tension to keep your embouchure flat in all the register not more you don't want to be adjusting your pitch by, by stretching your embouchure or doing all kinds of funny things you want to adjust it through the tongue movement or, or another uh, or in other words airspeed movement similar to like whistle <laughs> This is how you change the airspeed. So the more work you do here, the worse it gets. The more work you do through tongue and air, the more control you'll have over your high register. Normally pick exercises that start somewhere low, go higher, as easy as that. Chromatic scale is one of my favorite just because they have the smallest interval change between notes possible on brass instrument and some sort of arpeggiated exercise, uh, which is kind of semi-flexibility exercise, which starts at the bottom where the tension is pretty low and goes higher. That's the approach, and that'll fix, uh, uh, that, that's a broad kind of answer, but th that's the key to building register, both high and low. 
and, and sometimes I check myself too whenever I'm playing through certain things just to see the quality between my lower register and my higher register. So if, if I'm supposed to play a part that's up pretty high above the staff, sometimes I'll play that down the octave and I'll compare my tone quality and how I sound in a more comfortable register and then I'll compare it up to the higher sounds to see if it still has that same type of clarity or openness to the tone and, and things like that. So up octave, down octave in, uh, in quick yeah. repetition, like do a little tiny bit in the down octave and then immediately go up with that same tiny bit in the upper octave and use that to sort of compare compare the two and see if you can notice differences in those sounds. If you do notice the differences, then you'll need to focus on specifically what's going wrong with, with either the upper or the lower. Yeah, and one more thing I'd like to add as well. The problem, and one of the things I always try to do with my students, when you do high register is not as simple as flexibility practicing high register because in order to like really really learn how to good at high, be good at high register you have to play high and uh, whenever you're practicing certain skill you want to be focusing on a, on as little elements as possible normally where a high register becomes uh, a little tricky is because you you always end up playing an exercise that either has to chromatically go up so you want to make sure you get really really good at your chromatic scales where you're not thinking about your fingers at all because it's not a uh, it's not a range exercise anymore if you're focusing on your fingers it's a finger exercise so it's it's slightly tricky you know to to particularly practice a uh, high range but it's it's something i would approach in more of a, a consistency and over time uh, type of technique to learn rather than what we talked about fingers where the the more you do it the better you get the more fingers you practice you just get better and better and better and better that's not how it works with uh, high register just stay patient do it correctly and make sure that um, you follow those those little guidelines about aperture air uh, strength uh, that I mentioned again go check uh, my educational videos on youtube.com uh, slash matonis they're in, in great detail breaking down all of these aspects one by one. Okay, so the next question is coming from Samuel. I'm a semi-new player to euphonium, but I have mainly played trombone for about five years now. I'm currently 14 years old and have been using a normal Bach 6.5 AL mouthpiece. I've been looking to buy a Dennis Wick mouthpiece for my Yamaha YP842 TS euphonium, which I'm currently renting. I am I feel like we already uh, answered this one. I probably copied and pasted the wrong question question i mean we've talked about mouthpieces before i'm not sure if we entered this one specifically but i'm never the mouthpiece guy you know me yeah yeah yeah. i think Take i think it. i pasted i pasted an old question let's just scratch one i'm pretty sure that's an old question okay um israel is asking hello my name is israel i'm a euphonium player and a trombone player and i've been playing for four years now i'm going to high school and my high school does not provide instruments to students i don't own any of my instruments uh, and I rent them, but it's way too much money. And uh, buying one is out of my price range. So basically what Israel is asking, hey, do you have, uh, by any chance, do you have a spare euphonium you could send? But here's the deal. <laughs> Let me just quickly <laughs> address that. Uh, and I'll actually uh, bring this to the point I would like to talk about with you. So um, those instruments you see behind me, they're going to be, uh, if, if we were not on the lockdown at the moment, th those would be going to kids. So normally uh, River City has a really good program where we try to provide kids with instruments and uh, they'll go out. So unfortunately, I cannot give any of those because those were, were, will be going to kids sooner or later once we open back. But uh, what I wanted to, to get, uh, get to, is there any way, are you familiar with any programs or anything that uh, would help... Um, younger kids to get instruments and uh, how would you approach it uh, if uh, you were really low on budget and you wanted to get a euphonium because that's a relevant issue there's th there's some uh, for example pittsburgh has these programs like uh, the river city uh, youth school where we provide kids with instrument or try to provide as many uh, as many instruments to kids as possible well, how would you approach it if you were uh, like a 14 year old and we're trying to get an instrument but on relatively zero budget yeah well, i'll mention a couple of things that come to my mind as i think about that uh just p for personally and whenever i was first getting horns 
uh, I had to take out loans for every, I think every single one of my warrants. Yeah. I had to take out a, a, a small personal loan for every single one of my warrants and just pay it off a uh, little by little. I, I did that with three horns, three horns. And then of course I'd sell one and, and stuff like that and try to try to get another one. Uh, you know how that goes. But, uh, so, I mean, that's one option is just over time. If, if you could try to work out alone, I know this, this kid is pretty young, so it might not be a possibility, but maybe something with their, their parents or family that they could do something like that, stretch it out over a longer period of time. Uh, other than that, um, I, I would get a hold of local school districts or local colleges to see if they are getting rid of uh, equipment, equipment that might not be bad, but it might have been in use for quite some time. And you might be able to find you know, really good deals for certain things like that. There might be certain ones at school districts especially like public school districts where if they're not going to turn it in for other equipment or like a trade-in program, they might sell it outright uh, very cheap. You might even be able to get a hold of a district and they're getting rid of certain things and it could be possible where they can just even give you one of those. Um, as of certain organizations that would give instruments to people who are in need. I'm not aware of them specifically, like foundations and things like that. But you know, get a hold of the different groups that are in your area, whether it's community ensembles, college, uh, university music programs, um, school music programs, and ask them, to tell them about what you, the issues that you might be having and, and see if one of them could steer you in the direction of trying to get a horn for you or giving something available at a very low cost. Now, uh, one, and this is a, a, a genuine question because um, I, I have an idea, but I'm not entirely familiar with how it works in states. Um, a 14 years old, uh, if you're 14, if you're 14 year old kid, are you allowed to work? Summer job does that? Uh, I can't remember the age requirement, but I think back whenever I was that age, when I first got into high school, I was able to work on just a limited basis and only a certain amount of hours. So I believe I was allowed to work, yes, but not as much as like an adult would yeah, be. Yeah, obviously. So look, that would be that would be another option, and especially as far as I understand, this is a. Uh, a kid uh, who's from uh, United States, and and uh, look, uh, just uh, my personal experience. Uh, when when I was growing up uh, in in Lithuania, we have different currency. So, for example, in Lithuania, uh, it used to be for we used to have now it's euro, but it used to have litas. Okay, so you would the the buying power for one litas would be similar to buying power uh, uh, here in United States for one dollar. So United States, you could get similar amount of goods for one dollar, just like in Lithuania for one litas. But uh, one dollar would be like three or four of those. So um, the problem used to be uh, and most of it, Lithuania does not produce horns. So in order to save up for uh, for an instrument for like a thousand dollar instrument it will be equivalent in the united states to saving up for a four thousand dollar instrument so united states if i was if i was a, an american kid if i was 14 and i was allowed to work summertime i, I i'm sure i could save up a thousand dollars in three months <laughs> like working that that would be an approach i would take again i'm not familiar with with laws uh, in the united states but here's here's the deal that way you would never have to worry about um you know trying to figure out whether people will be willing to um, donate that instrument or and also uh, you'll appreciate the instrument a little bit more when um, you actually um, earned it yourself so I, I guess that's that's probably not the <laughs> not the <laughs> most that's probably not the most thrilling advice but that's how I would personally approach it okay uh, Bowder is asking, I'm studying Euphonium Concerto from Horowitz. Do you have any tips or tricks to study the third movement? Are you familiar with Horowitz uh, Euphonium Concerto? Oh, really? Oh, wow. What were you playing? What were you playing when you were in university? That's like the 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 
Yeah, that's the thing that like I sort of come across where I was so geared towards the music education things that, you know, I, I was more concerned with those types of things. So a lot of the standard lit that would normally have been played, I mean, I just didn't get into and I didn't focus the time on just because I was, you know, I only had a certain amount of time for lessons and... I was more focused on the music education gr- degree than than playing. So yeah. you know. Well, anyway, Harvest Concerto is one of the uh, one of the oldest uh, euphonium pieces that you can find, big, big, large piece. So, um, uh, and the concerto itself um, is interesting because it's difficult in in a different aspect. It's it's borderline where the technique is not super advanced requiring like it's 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 the third movement has some fast triplets but the the precision and the detail in the articulation and dynamic and stylistic markings it's it's a lot so it's uh, it's all about the detail like a lot of articulation markings there's very specific idea of how that piece should be executed so th- th- it's it's all about the stylistic so that that's normally the tricky bit about harvest concerto now the third movement that being said it has some um triplety bits that are that are kind of tricky and again the register not necessarily all too complicated and the approach i would take it is just divide um, those triplets into small bits one bar at a time learn it slowly uh, add three four clicks with every single time you play it through up to the point where you build it up build it up to the full tempo then go to next bar next bar up until you get those fast sections one bar at a time then start gluing gluing them up uh, into longer phrases and it's just basically a a, a little grinding work there um, in order to get the fingers down now stylistically um my 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 best suggestion for you would be uh would that piece record yourself as much as possible sometimes when we think we're being very um very we're playing very passionate and very emotional it's it's not how it's coming across whenever <laughs> whenever you're listening from the audience standpoint just because sometimes we tend to be a little bit too um too free with how we do all rubatos and stuff and the perception is very different when you have a be- bell vibrating next to your head record yourself as much as possible to understand whether you're stylistically fulfilling that piece and it will be so much easier to understand what you're doing when you're listening yourself um, back from a recording device especially nowadays it's uh, so easy to attain a, a decent audio recording device so that would be that would be my suggestion and anything you'd like to add on to this uh, i know you're not familiar with piece but <laughs> yeah i'm not familiar with the piece I, I can't really give specific information i mean i was more of a I mean, I was playing with the brass band throughout my entire undergrad, so I was more geared towards ensemble pieces and things like that, and not necessarily solo works. So I spent most of my practice time with uh, what we were doing with the Wind Symphony, what we were doing with the River City Brass, and and doing sorts of things. So that piece specifically, I mean, if I saw the piece and had a chance to play it, I'm sure I could give a bunch of info on it, but just just not familiar with it. Fair enough. Okay, let's go to Facebook questions. Jesus is asking, good evening. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. I would like to know your opinion about the cylinder or lever euphonium. Uh, we're talking about the rotor, rotor valves, I think, and that's what we were saying. Yeah. Like the Mirafone euphonium or the euphonium that I have, which is the Alexander M151 euphonium. What do you think about the cylinder <laughs> or levers? I'm pretty sure we're talking about uh, rotary valves here. Uh, have you ever tried these euphoniums? Any opinions? So I'll take this one off uh, to start. To start with, um, I that's the first instrument. Uh, the rotary rotary uh, German baritone horn was the the first instrument I start with. They would normally call them uh, weirdly either a baritone horn or tenor horn, even though it's not a tenor horn. It would be like a euphonium, a German style euphonium. But that's a uh, that's the first euphonium I had up until I was either. 14 or 15 i had one of those and then uh i finally could afford one of these old really really uh crappy gold uh, gold pl- well it wasn't gold plated it still it kind of had gold scratched off and it has it had some like brass bars but it was a piston british style um free valve euphonium but yeah there the ergonomics on those have you ever tried one of those 
I think I've tried one of those maybe once or twice at like different types of conferences and, and things like that. But those aren't too big here in the United States. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just piston for, yeah. for that throughout, you know, all the schooling and the, and the major brands and things like that. That, that we would get over here in the United States, it's it's not very common at all. M- more so of like a European, yeah, uh, European type of thing. Well, it's not it's not uh, too popular in European. Uh, it's more uh, Eastern Europe and and some uh, um, uh, maybe Germany use them uh, for for their uh, um, for some of their uh, what is it called? Uh, so European. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Marty pants. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, my personal opinion, I actually love those so much. The ergon the ergonomics on those and I don't know why they're not played more often. The tone now the sound changes a little bit, not as much as you would think if you have a good uh, rotary euphonium. But the ergonomics on that thing is actually designed like how it's supposed to be. You're holding that euphonium where your where your ro- rotary valves are where yeah, your valves are like right around this 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 height where it's a very comfortable position for your shoulders, elbows, and the instrument is so close to your body, so the center of gravity. I never had any ergonomic problems up until I got the piston euphonium. And to be fair, I don't even know why why they're so popular, the British style euphoniums. I really don't know because on, on paper, if you look uh, on, on the Fury side, I, I think that those rotary euphoniums have a lot of advantage. The yeah, advantages they are much more comfortable they uh, the, the bell is slightly curved so it's it has uh, it, ha- it still has a, a warm sound distinct warm sound but i feel that it's easier to get some clarity on those notes so i wish uh, i wish i could get a hold of one uh, which is high quality that would be interesting to do to to see even the differences with uh like the speed of playing between that type of rotary valve system and a piston system to see if there's an advantage to one or the other, like if playing through fast passages and yeah. things like that. And here's the deal. My personal experience, and again, I, I the, the rotary uh, baritone horn or euphonium that I had was not a great one. It's a bad one. But I've tried some, I had a chance to try some of the really good ones. And the range of motion for rotary valve versus a piston is smaller. The way that when you press the rotor, and it's the good ones move just as smooth. I, I really, really don't know how the how those uh, how the euphoniums that you see at the back, the British piston uh, euphoniums, how how they became so popular. I know they have that distinct sound, but I can get that sound on 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 those euphoniums as well. So that's something I I'm I'm actually looking into digging into a little bit uh, further no, in in future when I, whenever I have access because. Um, Believe it, believe it or not, I've actually played on more double belled euphoniums than piston. Never tried one. Experience. Never tried one. They're 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 pretty. They're they're interesting. They're, I could talk to you a little bit about that at, at another time. We have some stories about those. But <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go to some Instagram questions. Couple of questions here, and then we're gonna go to all the questions uh, that. Uh, you uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, who are watching the live stream left in the chat. That being said, John from Instagram is asking, Hi, I play a baritone. What is the highest note you can play? And the answer to that is uh, the note called infinity. It's so high <laughs> you cannot even hear it. Let me, let me demonstrate you an infinity free buzz. It was that high you could not even hear it. It's not even possible <laughs> to hear that. But that being said, uh, I, did, I, I normally I wasn't planning to include this. I just thought that uh, actually uh, that's a it, question. It, it, it depends on really. It depends on the day and stuff like that, like mm-hmm. how you're feeling, and lip wise and chop wise and and things like that. Um, there's some sounds that I could get to come out if I'm so you know quote if i'm having a good day or not i could get to a certain range but um and then there's certain sounds that i could get consistently every single time mm-hmm. in there and so i mean it all really depends on on a lot of different factors functional range versus range so functional range i'd say uh a high the high high i don't know whether it's called high or super high concert um g that would be a uh, that would I would still put that in my functional range because I played pieces with uh, that note, 
everything above that I cannot plug it in the piece you just I can squeeze it out and I, I can play it with relatively good projection up to a probably a super double super uh, concert C something like that uh, but it's just it's a waste of time I used to practice those a little bit more but I, I just I just found out over time it's kind of just waste of time at, at yeah yeah it's, I mean it's not it's not really used for anything you're not going to see any arrangements for any of those any of those sounds or examples to do so it's sort of just like hey how high can I go yeah but it's not necessarily a purpose for it yeah, focus focus on functional and developing functional range rather than than uh, what can you squeeze out uh, max on your euphonium Nils is asking, well, Nils, Nils is saying, hello, I just wanted to ask you if there's any solo pieces with band, ensemble, or piano or accompaniment for euphonium with distorted pedal. And what distortion pedal do you use with uh, the amplifier? And which amplifier? I would like to play something with it because it is something different and sounds awesome. Greetings from Germany. Say hi to Germany. Hello, Germany. Hi, Germany. Mm. Hi, Ger Germany, by the way, Germany and Austria, two of my favorite countries to go on holiday when I'm in Europe. Their food is fantastic. Have you ever uh, you ever been there? You've got some uh, German uh, German heritage, don't you? Yeah, Pennsylvania is, has a lot of uh, a German uh, background and, and things yeah. like that. But good food, uh, good beverages, especially the adult beverages, great there. Uh, that being said, uh, I played with distortion pedal just a little bit. I th I know there's a tuba piece written uh, for uh, specifically uh, for the use of pedals. I cannot remember exactly the name. I'm pretty sure it's Peter Meekin. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I, I think that's uh, who, who wrote that piece. So it might be something worth checking out. In terms of which pedal we use, it was just a random guitar pedal. The, the whole idea when I used that pedal on Smoke on the Water solo was putting a little mic uh, on the top of the bell so that the microphone will catch the signal and that um, microphone would be plugged through a distortion pedal then distortion pedal would be put in the amplifier. So what distortion pedal does not really matter. It was a guitar pedal. You can get any of those so that work. Which amplifier, again, does not really matter as long as the amplifies the sound. Now, the tricky thing with, um, I, uh, I don't know how many of you seen that video, um, but uh, you could hear the guitar sound, but you could not hear the euphonium sound. In order to do that, you have to play so, so, so quiet so it's 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 literally you, you have to be barely audible because that thing is very sensitive it's picking up the sound and it sounds like you're you're blasting but uh, I, uh, th that's the tricky part so i guess a s uh, silent uh, brass uh, from yamaha could be a good solution to fix the volume problems but i'm not familiar with any pieces dedicated to use of pedals uh, i might write one just because <laughs> I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little into that stuff. <laughs> you probably <laughs> realize, but um, I guess anything you'd like to add? No, I mean from what you said, there's, uh, I'm not familiar with specific works that are geared for that type of technology. I mean, we do things from time to time in the brass band where a tuba player might be might be using that sort of bass guitar effect and things like that, but. I mean, it's something that if you just want to get into and grab an effects pedal, whatever the mm -hmm. effects pedal may be, and uh, try to get yourself set up, I mean, it's just something to sort of have a good time with and, and to play along with. I mean, you could, if you wanted to, play a piece of guitar music, if you wanted to play like a melody line or something yeah, from yeah, that. Good, good, luck, good luck finding a guitar solo that doesn't have seven octaves <laughs> inside the range, so yeah have fun finding that <laughs> but either way hopefully that answers the question the last question and we'll go to the the chat uh, this one is coming from instagram h p r r underscore a g r hello i play euphonium for four years now i think uh, i have to buy a medium quality because uh, i would assume a, a budget a medium quality euphonium what would you recommend no normally it becomes a, a budget thing but these are the two euphoniums that I recommend for high schools and uh, anyone can, uh, anyone that uh, that that is looking to buy an affordable euphonium. I would highly, highly, highly recommend staying away from non-compensating euphoniums. I know they can get a little cheaper. You can save a couple hundred bucks. It used to be a big difference. It used to be a, a non-compensating euphonium, couple grand, compensating euphonium, five grand. Now the difference is so minor. If you can save up for compensating euphoniums. 
for a couple thousand dollars for anywhere between 1500 to 2000 dollars you can get euphoniums like jp274 that's the one i recommend as my number one choice for that budget wessex dolce schiller elite mag brass all those euphoniums will be better choice than a, a f even a fourth valve non-compensating euphonium and that could last you even for your university level if unless you're planning to do a performance major and then you'll probably have to um, look to a professional line euphonium eventually but uh, those would be uh, my preferences i i know uh, i know you're more familiar with yamahas and kings i, I first yeah go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I good. personally, those are two euphoniums I see most often, and I see the. Uh, this is how it normally works. Normally, there is a budget for high school uh, for a director to buy uh, to buy instruments, and they get them at a discounted price from Yamaha or from King, because they have to consider that they need to buy clarinets, saxophones, trumpets, all kinds of stuff. So it's it's much more affordable and makes sense to buy it from either one distributor or one brand. So that's why you see so many Yamahas and Kings. I the price uh, that those instruments the the free two ones and the king I cannot remember one that but the the non compensating euphonium it's more expensive than than a, a good compensating instrument nowadays so if possible if you're buying by yourself so make sure it's a compensating how to know whether it's compensating two things to look for obviously it should mention description the fourth valve will always be on the bottom and also look for a longer extension on your valve. If it's a slow, uh, uh, if it's a short looking valve, then that's a, that's a non compensating. Longer looking valve it will have additional tubings. That would be my suggestions. Anything? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I have something I could recommend for sure for, for that. I, I always recommend Swedish fish. Oh, those the <laughs> Swedish fish. Those, by the way, are uh, Birute likes those because they are vegan. Did you know they are vegan? Does it say it on here? I don't think it says, but if you read through description, I'm pretty sure they're vegan. Yeah, I, I haven't seen, but uh, it, it, once again, man, it's it's good. So shout out to Swedish fish. Shout out to Sweden. <laughs> you we, 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 we answer so many questions, and I, I use up so much brain energy to to come up with these answers, and I, I just. Why? Why? Uh, why? Why does? Why? Why do fish? Uh, why does the fish look so weird in Sweden? Why? Why they're red? Is this like a micro salmon or something like that? What's I'm the not deal? Sure, I mean, you're kind of close to that area, so I'm, I've never been to Sweden before. But. <laughs> looks like a very tiny fish there. Well, thanks for the food plug. That's nice. They're boneless. Yeah. Oh, good. That's my favorite. Okay, let's go to live chat. <laughs> Now, uh, preferably, I recommend getting a banana or apple to get your uh, dose of. Uh, oh, now, now, now we see what you're doing. You're just plugging in uh, sugary, sugary Swedish fish. How dare you? I hope, I I hope a candy company one one day gets a hold of you and I. Sponsors. I've been getting. I've been getting. I've been getting. You would not believe. I've been getting offers for a well-paid ads if i was to dedicate a video but that the companies that are asking me their product they they've been asking me to give shout outs and plug in vpns and variety of music software and every single one that i tried was so bad that and they offered a decent yeah. amount of money and i was like it will be good that will cover a lot of equipment but i just cannot i cannot do it it's yeah, so it's bad like, it's like selling your soul like why, why would you say something and promote something that you don't necessarily like but i love swedish, swedish fish, fish. Come okay. on, swedish. that being said give a shout out to lithuania i'm seeing some lithuanian peeps hello lithuania hello lithuania hello I need to teach you uh, that. I taught you that a while ago, but let's go to questions. I saw some good questions. How much time do you guys practice a day? Two to five hours. That would be my standard. Closer to two to three most of the times, but every single day, every single day, no matter what, whether it's Christmas, New Year, or whatever, I'm 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 a very much a believer uh, con in consistency. But uh, I try to I try to uh, get two to three hours a day on days where I'm practicing something low or i need to really learn some of a rep and my go as, as far as five hours after five i feel that uh it feels like somebody hit me with a brick uh straight in my face <laughs> so i cannot end yeah, my myself i like one and a half to to two if it's getting closer to 
important concerts and things like that or if i have uh, excerpts that i need to work on very quickly like if we have something for the for the brass band and we only get it a handful of days before our first performance I'll, I'll spend a good three to three and a half hours of, of practicing to make sure i have enough time to dedicate to those specific excerpts all right uh hello from england hello england say hi to england hi. Okay. A lot of people don't know that I lived five years in Manchester. I like Man. I I like Manchester a lot. It reminds me a lot of uh, a lot of Pittsburgh. So New York would be more similar to London in terms of uh, the uh, the uh, the amount of people, the 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 speed of life, and how people walk. And Manchester would be kind of similar to Pittsburgh, a very uh, very student heavy uh, city. And summer it would quiet down. That would be nice okay let's go to next question uh, um, how to play a concert b flat uh, second octave uh, concert b uh, second on a non-compensating instrument which which uh, which b is that b2 uh, it's the higher octave the higher octave uh, no the no b i'm pretty sure well <laughs> it would be probably on one two or three or non-compensating it depends whether it has a foul i don't know what i if it's a high b natural up there the different combinations you could do uh one two and three uh you can do one and two could be a possibility up there okay. uh two would two work up there i i play it on two, two. i play it on two two, two could yeah. be a possibility just second yeah. mouth yeah that's what i do uh but you want check i mean to get back to that question too i mean you want to check those different combinations and see what really works and what has the best intonation and projection and clarity well with that i mean yeah. it's worth it's worth trying all of those different combinations. intonation comes number one every single time i'm actually going to do a video on that you, uh, but uh, intonation number one then uh, tone and then uh, comfort that's what i go or centering in other words that's how i normally figure out my vowel combinations how often do you get in touch with other people from your band i actually just texted recently with jeff um uh, not now i i you're you're more or less the only person you and brian are the only people you because i get to see you once a week uh, here we we text each other but uh this is uh this is our time to uh, you know, uh, just uh, catch up a little bit, but uh, normally uh, quite often, just because we play so much. But uh, this is obviously a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of exception. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, whenever we're really in the thick of things with rehearsals and performances, I see the band members more than I see my family, more than I see my wife. You know, because you know, by the time I get back home you know from a gig or a rehearsal she might be in in asleep already and you know can't just wake her up and, and talk to her so i mean we we see the different band members and depending on the person too i mean you see people you're gonna see the whole band when you're with the whole band but as for the other players like within our section i'll talk to a lot more i see you quite often and we're always so busy and we're always working and playing our instruments. That's why I like going along with you. Oftentimes we'll, we'll go maybe once a week, maybe every week, every couple of weeks to the movie theater and just relax and, and go see a movie and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. well, that's going to have to wait for a little bit. Brian, uh, Brian Paxter is asking, uh, Hey Matonis, you said you'll be releasing a new rock song around beginning of April. Um, in your last uh, original release, uh, video release, uh, did something happen? Yes, uh, it's it's a lockdown that happened. <laughs> so, but uh, that hopefully will be out this week. I'm working uh, through mixing uh, the song um, um, uh, through phone and on the stuff. The plan is still released this month. It's just a little bit delayed because everything. Uh, all my schedule and everything uh, went outside the window. I spent uh, the whole month to set this up. Not it, believe me when I tell you it. It's like a, I'm I'm more busy now than when when I normally work. This is how much time is consuming. So, uh, yeah, I'll I'll make sure I'll do my best to get that uh, 
I already uh, mentioned that on my Patreon that uh, this month I'll, I'll try my best to get it mixed and done and published this month with all the sheet music. If not, I will at least publish because it's all recorded. It just needs um, finishing some of the editing uh, work and, uh, and mixing. If not, I will at least put a demo on Patreon with all the scores, so at least minimum. But uh, that'll get published soon, as well as uh, I'll be uh, I'll be doing other pieces on a monthly basis as well. That that still stays uh, stays a part of the plan. It's just slightly delayed now, so that's that. Um, I'm not going to ask you to add anything on that, <laughs> I would assume. No, I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. That's actually a good question. Uh, Aaron is asking, I listened to a podcast run by some professional composers. One was giving the argument against techniques books, technique books like Arben uh, because it takes away from the artistry and emotion of music. Your thoughts. Okay, so your personal choice. Here's the deal. Uh, there's there's upsides and downsides to Arben. Arben will, uh, is a book that has the largest compilation of extended techniques that you will find ever in one book, ever. It's the most extensive book in all the tri triple tongue exercises, all the good stuff. If you want to get really, really good at playing your air varies, that's the way to go, Arben. Also, if you cannot afford buying all the pieces and all that stuff will cost you a lot of money, you go download Arben for free, I'm SLP. You download it for free, it's one of the best books, that's what I grew up on, Arben. That's where all my technique is coming from. Now, the problem with that, it does not really give you a good approach in terms of how to learn stuff. There's a lot of exercises, there's a lot of different exercises, as, as great as, uh, as a variety gets. In my personal opinion, the most important thing to getting good or getting good as quickly as possible is the correct approach to it. So that was a big problem with me. I just used to run through the whole book without any structure, knowing what to do. So look, uh, it's uh, I I see why why uh, some people don't like it, but it's almost like uh, I don't know. Look, you're gonna find a bunch of exercises. It's not like a magical book. It does not magically make you get better or get you worse, or it will magically make you non-musical. If you want to get better at technique, practice that. If you have access to pieces, buy all kinds of pieces. You'll get same different looks. You're going to get uh, looks for your triple tongue, double tongue, your chromatic scales, as long as you play through a variety of repertoire. And in my opinion, it's a great book. Can it, uh, can it uh, take away from uh, your musicianship? I guess. If, if you're not aware of that, if that's the only thing you're practicing, then I guess that's the only thing you're going to be good at. If you practice Arben and then go play your Rochute or whatever melodies you're, you're, you're doing, you're working your technique and phrasing and musicality. So I see, I see the point. I just... I just, I, I, I would not say, I would not recommend using that book. I just, I would recommend paying attention that, hey, if you just do an overkill on Arben, you might develop one area which is going to be over overshadowing all the other aspects. So any, any opinions on that? Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I, I see those, the technique books as just a tool to get me to become a better musician. I wouldn't say that those books help me to be more artistic. They just help me to be more accurate and correct with the things that I'm trying to, to play. Like, for example, if, if I just had a solo work that I had to play and it had a bunch of double tonguing in there and I really didn't know how to double tongue, I'm not just going to try to double tongue on that solo work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to a technique book like the Arben book and for you know a lot of the Arben book, there's a nice like systematic approach to how it moves to to different skills and how you build upon different skills. So, if with an example like that, I like the method book because it's a tool that I could use to try to make that solo work a little bit more. Um, it, I don't think of it as uh, along those lines that that person is saying like. Uh, the technique book and not being artistic or a solo work and you could be more artistic with that. It's just the technique is the technique book is information that I could learn and and common things like arpeggios and scales and different types of tongues and different types of ornaments and things like that. 
Um, if I see an ornament in a solo work, it's not going to tell me what I need to do to play that ornament in the, in the solo work. But if I go to the technique book, yeah, it's going to tell me how to do it. It's going to give me exercises to practice, to be able to work on those, those types of things. So, uh, I, I spend a bunch of time out of technique books and, and Arben books and, it allows me to be a better musician so that I could focus on playing in a more artistic way. Even though the technique book doesn't get me to be artistic, it gives me exercises that I could practice and work on that improve my musical abilities. And then I can move to those other pieces of work where I work on my phrasing or artistry and things like that that's sort of how i uh, approach that idea and it will give you technical freedom once you have technical freedom you can focus more on on musical stuff as well so again uh, i find that book to be overwhelmingly useful also that's one of a few look it's free it's a fantastic book and you can download it for free so hey uh you're calling this one but this is just our opinion on that um Okay, this is another good one. Suggestion on increasing lung capacity. I have recently started playing again and I seem to run out of there too quickly. Any tips uh, or techniques? Yes. So let me quickly explain the difference between, uh, uh, for those who might not be familiar with, the difference between lung capacity and lung function. Lung function is, uh, it, uh, cons- uh, that's, that's a metric that uh, consider, uh, consists out of a couple of numbers. So uh, lung function consists of the total amount of uh, air that your lungs can hold how fast you can get air in your lungs, out your lungs, how fast you can get uh, um, oxygen into your bloodstream, and how fast um, you can take out uh, carbon dioxide of your bloodstream. So that's uh, these, these, uh, these different metrics, uh, they uh, compile into one thing called lung function. Now, normally it changes a little bit as you grow up, as, but once you're a fully matured person, it stays or decreases. You cannot increase it. So it only goes down, and it can be uh, the ex- uh, that descent can be accelerated through bad habits, such as smoking, respiratory diseases, which is actually relevant now. This is why we're cooped up in our houses, sitting because we cannot afford that. I uh, learned a new word. You see that? Uh, quick learner, told you. Okay, <laughs> a drum chorus. Uh, getting, getting, <laughs> getting, getting better. At that. Uh, <laughs> back to back to the question. This is what you want to do. Lung, lung capacity is uh, how much air we utilize, and that's a, a metric that can be improved. Now, how you do that, two, two things. Uh, the, the idea, you want to take the full breath. You want to practice breathing exercises that will allow you to take the fullest breath possible and the fullest exhale possible. And you normally control that through airspeed. So here's the deal. Whenever we get to that uncomfortable uh, lung capacity, our lungs work like a balloon. So if you were to try and blow up a balloon, it will fill up very easily in the very beginning. And once it becomes a little bit more full, you'll notice that in order to put more air into it, it becomes a little bit more resistant. It's same same conception here. Our rib cage and um, muscles, outer muscles, are holding our lungs. And once, once we become closer to full lung capacity, we start feeling a little bit of resistance here. So in order not to get tight and uncomfortable, not to get that, you need to slow down your inhale. So if I was to take a very full inhale, in order to take take that 100%, you, you could hear that at the very ending, my inhale was slowing down. The same thing at the very bottom, you'll have to slow down. There are good devices such as, um, uh, actually I actually have it on hand, spirometers, uh, one that I have here is called Voldyne 5000, 10 bucks on Amazon. You will normally be able to, it's actually in the description box below, you can check it out. I'm not trying to plug in that, that was the actual question, <laughs> but you can find an affiliate link in the description box below. This will allow you to track down the speed. It shows you what speed is a good speed for optimal diaphragm use and what amount of air you're taking. So you visually can track progress. And uh, this, this will allow you to gradually get better at, um, uh, utilizing fuller lung capacity, but you need to make sure you're taking those full breaths, adding a little bit of resistance, maybe uh, taking one of the mouthpieces and um, 
I'm trying to find a mouthpiece. Anyway, uh, putting an index finger inside the cup to cover the hole and breathing through the shank to add some resistance and uh, making sure you take that full breath would help a lot. But you need to, that's again, it's, I, I consider that a strength building exercise, not a technique exercise. So you need to make sure you're taking those 100% breaths. No matter, it might not be a functional way of breathing for now for your playing just because it's, it's going to take a little while to take that full full inhale but that's how you get better at it <sighs> making sure you track that so that's uh, there's no other way of getting better at it making sure you take those full breaths beyond that comfort comfort uh, zone up until it becomes uh, uh, a part of the comfortable breath. So, any anything you'd like to add on that? No, just just what you said. I mean, it was fantastic. It it just b sort of boils down to: Are you breathing in the correct way? Yeah. But basically, I mean, that's so. That's and uh, look, uh, it, I, I, I you would you would think too that like breathing, oh, it's just this easy thing. You take a breath. It's it is. It, you realize how many things could go wrong in, in just simply trying to take in a correct breath. Yeah, and it becomes way more complicated when you, that, that area that you're breathing from, which is your mouth, is covered with a mouthpiece. And also you have 15 pounds of brass in front of you. That changes everything. It's much easier to breathe for singing than it is for brass. And look, you have to really control your speed. What you want to do is eliminate all the accessory breathing muscles. You want to eliminate your shoulders, your upper chest, and your back from breathing. You want to make sure diaphragm is not a voluntary muscle. It's involuntary. Use it no matter what. But it's still a muscle. The accessory muscles are voluntary. You can get you can get rid of them. Now here's the deal. Normally we breathe in through our nose. That controls the speed of our inhale. So you can only breathe in so, breathe in so fast, and that's where normally your diaphragm operates very comfortably. Imagine if you had a, a dumbbell and you're trying to do a bicep curl, and you were swinging that dumbbell. It might be a bicep curl, but you might not even be using bicep. You might be using your core and your shoulder. You might be using accessory muscle. But if you do it correctly, slowly, and engaging it, that's when you do the exercise properly. That's the way you should be approaching breathing as well, controlling your airspeed. If you try to take this type of full breath very quickly, See what happens. Your shoulders raise. All the accessory uh, muscles start to spasm, and you're not actually taking as full of a breath. Also, you'll lose all the control here that is required for exhale. In our, in, in our context, we'll be exhaling through vibrating our lips. So making sure you control the speed of your inhale. You take those full 100% breaths in and out. Very good question. I like that a lot. Okay. Let's get to another one. Uh, 16 year old, uh, 16 years in order to work. Somebody is texting. Your 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 mom is texting <laughs> that you should be 16 in order to work. Okay. Uh, in uh, okay. And my apologies if I'm mispronouncing the name. I'll try my best. But I know that's one of the patrons and uh, one of the lady who's watching the videos all the time. Bing Cheng Ellen Wang. In a place in a playing season, how do you divide your time with rehearsals, practice, and other stuff? I'll let you start this off. During the playing season, how do I balance? Well, I mean that's really just a tough question. It's it's always just a balance of the important things in life. So you balance your family life, your work life. Um, and sometimes it's hard. It's it's hard to do. Um, there's been many years, and and as I look back, it's it's a uh, it's a sad thing because I spent so much time on myself and focusing on getting better with my you know instrument and playing career, and and I teach at the school and things like that. So you sort of put the family on the back burner. As sad as that as sad as that sounds and you really miss out on a, on a lot. So, the, I mean, the more, the older that I get, the more that I realize that, um, you know, and even what's going on right now with, uh, uh with what's taking place in the, in the, in the world with the, this virus and that, uh, gives you an opportunity to think about the people that are most important. And, uh, 
you just try to find a, a balance. I think everyone's balance is different than everyone else. Um, I'm, I'm sort of like a workaholic. I really like to work. Um, I spend most of my time, like on a given day, whenever whenever everything is is whenever we're performing, you know, I get up at 5:30 in the morning, and then I go and I'm a school teacher, and I'm finished around three o'clock, and then I might have like an hour or so. I might not even come home, and then I'll go to either rehearsal at seven o'clock or uh, performance, and then I'll get back to my house at around like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and then the next day happens, and then I do the exact same thing. So it, it's hard to balance because you need to work and pay the bills and take care of things and, and all of that, but uh, you, you really miss out on your family and your friends. Um, I don't have a strict balance or I don't have like a strict plan. I, I mainly, you know, just get up and work and, and you just try to make those connections uh, with, with your home life as, as much as you can. Yeah. And look, uh, for me, for me, the answer has always been, look, practicing and working is my life. <laughs> it's, it, it is literally my life. That's all I do. I, I do very few things. I practice, I perform, Nowadays, almost vast majority of my time goes to content creation because uh, I'm, I'm sitting home. So and normally there's a decent amount of time that goes to that. But nowadays, vast majority of time is making sure I produce uh, three times or four times more content than normally. But that's my life. And that's what I always wanted to do. Figure out, figure out a job or a, f or a thing you want to do as a career that will that will best suit your character qualities. Like I'm, I'm a very routine person. I don't get bored ever from practicing. I just don't. I found out through the years that I can practice same thing over, and over and over and over again. Never get, never get bored. Never a problem. Like, but the problem becomes once I don't have a routine. That's why you saw as soon as we went to lockdown, I put myself in a schedule. I tried to figure out what time, what stream. How how can I do? Because otherwise I'm I get depressed. I get sad. I don't know what to do. I need to be in schedule. I need to be always working. And I make sure that uh, uh, my close friends, you're one of my close friends, my family members becomes a part of. Well, it's it's not the right way of expressing probably, but th that work work involves those people as well that I get to see get to get to see those people so that's how I've been approaching I make sure that I figure out what things I really love in my life I love working out I love practicing I like performing and in order for me to do those things uh, all together and and uh, I, I found out that uh, in order for me to play and practice euphonium I need to become a prof professional musician so I can make living out of that so that's how I balance out that, that's just the way my life is I don't I don't go out much you're you're the only person I go out once in a while for a movie and that's not because uh, I, I find I personally consider that optional like I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't go out much I don't go to parties Although I don't consider myself not being a social person. I just work all the time. I work 60, 70, 80 hours a week every single day. Now everyone's on lockdown working 10, 12 hours a day every single day. N does not bother me at all. So, But uh, that's how I pretty much just roll. Might not be the most exciting lifestyle for somebody. But hey, I don't mind it at all. Well, hopefully that answers <laughs> that question. Uh, what's your tip on learning uh, treble clef for euphonium? Uh, we had this question quite a few times. Okay, C couple quick t uh, quick tips. Uh, whenever you uh, uh, whenever you have something that you learned that you already know, a solo piece, find that solo piece in a treble clef, and 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 read it off a treble clef. You'll be more familiar with the music because you already played it in bass clef. It'll be easy to convert. Now uh, scales. That will be super important. Practice your exercise and turn your routine that you normally practice, your practice routine that you normally practice from bass clef into treble clef. You're more likely to be familiar with those exercises. Just give as much reading in a treble clef. And uh, it's the same thing. It's pretty mechanical. Repetition, 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 repetition. No better way of doing that. Any, any 
thing you like yeah, to just, I mean, just get just get comfortable with the cleft the more you do it the better you're going to be with it but also like recall exercises i mean there's a lot of online programs and a lot of free exercises on uh, on the internet where you could pull up uh treble clef exercises and do things with like note identification pitch identification for that um if you're not spending all the time practicing you know pull that up on your phone or a computer and just you just practice okay the lines and the spaces of the of the treble clef staff uh, as much as you can until you, it just becomes a, a part of you and, and you're familiar with it okay hello from texas hello texas okay usa is sending some best wishes for us so okay where are your co concerts performed at i would assume we're referring to river city brass so we have regular venues uh that are around pittsburgh inside pittsburgh it's oakland at the carnegie music hall uh uh t -t 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 then it's penn hills uh, at um linton linton linton, linton uh, school then it's north hills carson then upper sinclair uh, school in uh, uh, south uh, south hills and then uh, palace greens uh, palace theater in greensburg those would be five regular venues and then we uh, travel outside uh, outside pa and uh, florida florida is uh, a common uh, and frequent destination uh, so but uh, you need to go to rivercitybrass.org click events or schedule i don't know what section is under on and you'll find all our schedule lined out if uh, for our personal events the well you're not going to find uh, mike on social media because he's not the most uh, social media savvy person out there don't blame him uh, actually uh, <laughs> the more <laughs> the more i think about it it yeah. makes sense <laughs> <laughs> but uh i whenever i perform you'll find announcements on my social media so but I would assume that would be a reference for River City Brass um, venues. Uh, for your song, My Word, does Vashid music on Patreon include vocals? Um, I don't think so. Maybe I should put on. Uh, I don't know. Are, is anyone interested in the vocals, uh, vocal sheet music? I don't know. Maybe I should put it. Uh, okay, that being said, let's go find a couple more questions and we're going to be wrapping this up very soon. Many great questions and I appreciate everyone who's tuning in. And also, if you enjoyed this video, you could do us a big favor by giving this video a thumbs up by Try subscribing and hitting that notification bell for all the latest news and updates. Also, <laughs> don't forget to comment, share this with your friends or on your <laughs> social media platforms. Thank you very much. Do it live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, is there any difference in playing a marching euphonium or baritone and a normal euphonium and baritone? To be fair, there's not that many similarities <laughs> between. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 way different in every single way. I would never ever want to play on a on a marching horn unless I was marching <laughs> i mean that's the I, only uh, you know it, and, and even that it's not even necessarily easier i mean you see like back in the day like old school they would have the bell front euphoniums and they would even march with the bell front euphoniums even those are more comfortable than holding up the the larger uh, marching euphoniums so i don't even know if i would say yeah use a marching euphonium uh, because it's easier to to operate I, I don't even think that <laughs> that's funny the first time i've tried a marching baritone or euphonium i think it was euphonium was my first marching proper marching gig that i did with river city on uh, what parade uh, do we normally do with river city which one is it is it uh, may yeah we did normally do the memorial day memorial parade. yes weekly I swear to God, one of the most embarrassing moments of my life, I could not hold that thing. I work out all the time. I consider <laughs> myself a physically fit person. I could not hold that thing for more than a couple of minutes. My, I was shaking. I was walking. Shake. I just I started playing down. It was embarrassing. We had to do it for an hour. Probably the worst, <laughs> like the hardest, physically the hardest 
gig that I ever did. Uh, following years, I started marching with our with my regular phone. You might find that way way easier. So, um, that being said, I don't know. I don't know how some of those uh, kids do it. It's it's pretty hard. You you get used to. It. I know you have to lean back a little. There's techniques. There's like ways to do it, but um, there's not that many similarities outside you use the same finger combinations and same mouthpiece. It does not blow the same way. It, it blows a little bit more like a trombone, like a bad version of trombone. Like a very... <laughs> It seems like just the quality of those marching horns are, are nowhere near the quality of uh, of a normal. Yeah, I've tried a couple of decent marching horns, but eh, still not uh, not something I would like to do that often. Okay, a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up. Um, have you ever incorporated Alexander technique in your practice sessions? Um, I learned a little bit of Alexander technique through the uh, through the university. Um, we didn't do too much of, of it, uh, from what I remember and what I gather from Alexander technique, uh, it really worked to, you know, relax your muscles and things like that so that you could perform better and you, you can notice the different areas of tension and stress that you're putting on, on your body and in, in specific, uh, areas. I don't necessarily, and I can't remember too much of like strict Alexander technique methods, but I mean, there's different things that I'll look for whenever I'm playing and sort of try to find my tendencies. Am, am I tensing a certain part of my body too much or my face or things like that? And either just trying to stretch it out or, or do the things that I need to do to, to, to try to stop that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a yoga guy, I, but that's a part of uh, something I do in the gym. I just make sure I do a bunch of breathing alongside. I know it uh, worked for some people. It's very popular here in States, and I, I think it's a good idea. I just never personally invested too much time in it. Uh, no good reason, just never had, a, never had a chance. Now, this is a question I wanted to answer previously, and I don't know whether this gentleman asked it on the comment, but I know somebody uh, left a comment about bear, uh, beard and mustache and how it affects your playing and that's actually a serious qu uh, question um hey Montonis, i have a beard like yours a bit more on the chin uh but i struggle with creating a proper tone if i do not shave any advice on how to have better control over my tone so here's the deal as you can see i have not been shaving for a little while normally <laughs> i'm uh, uh that's my uh, that's my new haircut or lack of haircut and lack of shave so I figured I'm gonna grow this out up until we're locked down. But here's the deal: I need to control the length of my uh, mustache. Uh, I I make sure it does not get to the point where it starts going on my lips. So my uh, mustache don't go sideways; they just go on top. So that's the only area that is uh, bothering. As long as I keep it relatively short here, no problem whatsoever. Now, that being said, uh, I've heard people that as soon as I, I know some really great players that as soon as they grew a little bit of beard and mustache and one of them would be uh, my former teacher at CMU Lance Leduc he, the mouthpiece would not seal he would have to shave his beard and and all the facial hair hair in order to play well if you have to do it you'll have to make an option I know beard having a beard is cool especially for people who are passionate about you know growing and trimming and taking care of their beard or whatever but uh, if it affects your playing, just shave it off. Or, or if if you don't care about your playing quality, there's there's no technique. It's it's preventing the seal. It's an additional surface on your lip. Look at it that way. And if you have, uh, I I think uh, I I don't have any scientific evidence for that, but I think it's a lot to do with your teeth structure. If you have a relatively uh, symmetrical teeth, normally the mouthpiece tends to close nicely whether you have mustache or not and uh, for people who don't have very symmetrical teeth that can become a, a big problem so just shave it off you know and that would be my best my best advice any anything you you grow some mustache once in a while yeah i mean not too often because i, I don't like i don't like the feel it doesn't necessarily make me make more mistakes or something like that maybe Maybe if it gets to be a little bit too much, but I know it just starts to get uncomfortable to play, to like physically play, um, if there's like a lot of facial hair. So most of the time, I, I I'll just shave as as much as I can to to not have to to worry about that. So mm -hmm. definitely not a, not a fan of. 
<laughs> so I'll answer. I'll answer one more question. I'll answer one. Uh, we'll answer one more question. But before that, I I'm seeing a couple of people who are regular uh, uh, um, uh, regular uh, viewers and who al always donates and uh, and um, contributes to the show. And uh, uh, Maxwell is saying, uh, "Hey, nice to see you guys again. I wanted to find those people on the live stream last time. Here's the deal." If Maxwell and Ian and uh, there was a couple of other people, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting. For those uh, people who are donating on these chats, uh, if uh, because patrons normally get some sheet music. If you like to get an exercise from a video or one of the arrangements, email me because I really appreciate those donations. And I always, always want to give some sort of a value. I know this is informative and pre people appreciate it, but I always like to give as much value uh, to people with these streams. So uh, to, those, uh, to those folks and uh, shout out to Tony as well, to all the sponsors uh, of the show and all the patrons who've been supporting um, and if you're if you're donating through a super chat, email me later on, and I'll I'll send you some exercises uh, if you wish, obviously. But that being said, I appreciate all the support. One more question: I'm gonna um, I'm seeing one. Uh, uh, okay, I'm seeing one comment from one of the patrons, but I will do a patron exclusive uh, um, tomorrow, so I'll answer patron questions tomorrow. Hi from Manchester, England. Hello, uh, hello Manchester. And the last question would be, um, how do I prevent loud valves on my phone? Is there something wrong? Should I purchase something to fix it? Yes and no. Probably yes. Um, <laughs> that person who asked about beard, uh, he, he said, thanks for answering, but I do like my beard, though. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess <laughs> he's throwing away the playing. Good choice. <laughs> beard number one. <laughs> the best. But that being said, yes, check your valve guides. So here's the deal uh, with... Um, um, with with uh, with a lot of instruments like Yamaha, often the valve guide has a metal metal insert, which is great because it prevents the valve from breaking. However, once the plastic surface surface scratches off, the metal has a contact with your with the surface uh, where your valve goes, and it, it starts becoming significantly louder. If that's the case, check out your valve and see if you have metal sticking out of the plastic bit which guides your valve into into the, the place into the pipe if that's the case replace them they're normally very cheap another thing that could be making a lot of sound is your springs now normally uh, uh, if the sound appears if you buy an instrument with quiet valves and sound uh, valve noise becomes louder as you as you pl practice months and months it's normally a valve guide if you buy one with already a uh, big type of sand and you cannot find any metal sticking out on your valve guys check your springs might be worth investing into those other than that uh, make sure that your valve is uh, properly screwed on because if it's a little loose it might rattle anything you'd like to add yeah and you mentioned some of the things that i was going to mention um, even with the springs too, this was a big difference just to share a little personal thing. I recently had my baritone horn, it's a Besson baritone horn in for repair and they, I haven't had it in for repair for a decent amount of time, but there were these, um, plastic almost, not plastic, they were like a rubber type, um, a spring dampening. It's like a little cushion. Oh, it's cover. It's cover. It's a poly, yeah. a poly, a po poly plaster covering. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, they would always sort of dry out, and I, I I thought, and the technician who was working on my horn thought, like, yeah, we don't really need these. Let's just get rid of them, and everything will be okay. But whenever I got that horn back and I was playing on it, I was surprised at how important those things were too to stop the vibration from the the spring from whenever I was playing and the spring buzzing and things like that was very annoying. So I had to get, I had to get some of those and, and replace that to, to fix that issue. But also too, you can think of the, the felts and the corks that are up towards the top of the valve too. You want to make sure that, I mean, if you're missing some of those, you're going to get uh, uh, sounds and things like that taking place whenever the valve reaches back up, up towards the, the top. Um, yeah. And, in, and in what, what he said too of you know make sure your top and your bottom uh, valve when you're screwing it in uh, make sure that that's a little bit tighter because you can get sound from that you can get sound from the springs the valve guides the felts and and the, the corks that are on on the valves 
Okay, let me just quickly make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining this live stream. Uh, hopefully, you got some of your questions answered. Uh, appreciate everyone who's been watching. Appreciate everyone who gave this video a thumbs up, subscribed, clicked the notification bell, <laughs> shared this with your friends or on your social media platform. You're, try you're trying too hard. Just talk normal. <laughs> over the world. Trying to <laughs> <laughs> I got look, I practiced these lines so much just because I do them in every single video. That's the only the only thing I can do speak fast, uh, say fast while while speaking in English. So <laughs> I just keep on plugging this over and over again. But that being said, thanks so much for watching and um uh hopefully we can do this stream again on Saturday if Mike is available. We'll figure that out later on, but um, I will post the schedule Monday, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. It's not finished there, but I'm very confident. It's not finished yet, but I'm very confident I'll be able to finish all the editing for the full uh, brand new arrangement of Host Second Suite in F by our colleague Drew Fennell, fantastic arranger, great player, and he made a special arrangement for me and for YouTube channel. Uh, so hopefully Monday 5 p.m. it'll be uh, published and um, check that out. I will put the schedule for next week's streams uh, the same Monday. So it's going to be a day from tomorrow, tomorrow, Sunday. And tomorrow, for those who'd like to tune in, uh, I'm going to be doing an exclusive uh, Patreon live stream. If you'd like to join um, join the ranks of my patrons, go check patreon.com slash Matonis. And we will see you all next week, friends. Okay? Take care. Have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you for joining. Stay safe. Stay well. And bye-bye.